Our parable this morning is one of the less well-known ones. Right before it, Jesus is speaking with a group of Pharisees about the kingdom of God. And the story that immediately follows it is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector going to the temple to pray, one that we discussed a few weeks ago. This parable of the widow and the judge is not one that we tend to hear a lot. It is not like the good Samaritan or the prodigal son stories that we hear from childhood for those who grew up in the church. Listen again to the parable. Jesus says, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God, no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. There are two main characters in this parable, the widow and the judge. And so to understand the parable, we need to look at each of them more closely. Widows are common characters throughout Scripture. We can think of Tamar in Genesis 38, Ruth, who stayed with her mother-in-law Naomi after their husbands died, and the other daughter-in-law, Orpah. We can think of Abigail, whose story can be found in 1 Samuel 25, and these are just a few of the widows found in the Hebrew Bible. In Luke's gospel alone, he mentions at least six widows. There is Anna, who is an example of constant prayer. Judith, the widow at Zarephath, who is also mentioned in 1 Kings, but Luke recounts her story. The widow of Nain, who lost her son, whom Jesus then raised from the dead because of his deep compassion. There is the widow who brings her coins to the temple, even though she had little to give. Most widows in biblical times didn't have an easy life. Women didn't inherit property or money after their husbands or fathers died. They didn't have much social status. It was difficult, so many of them had to sell themselves or find another husband or go back to live with their families in order to survive. This is why the scriptures place great emphasis on taking care of the widows. Consider Psalm 68, where it says, Father of orphans and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. In Exodus 22, we read instructions for the Israelites. You shall not wrong or oppress a resident alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. You shall not abuse any widow or orphan. And in James 1:27, we are told, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. We are called over and over to take care of those like the widow who have little voice in society, who need assistance in whatever ways that they are lacking. We hear about these women who break the stereotype and manage to support themselves and their households, and we would be remiss, though, to think that these women, even the ones who needed a male relative to support them, were simply weak or needy. As Amy Jill Levine writes, to live in a patriarchal system is not the same thing as being weak. 
And we see this in our widow, in our parable today. We know nothing about her. She may be poor, she may be destitute, but she is advocating for herself in front of this judge. She is fighting for what she believes she deserves. We don't know the details, but we do get a glimpse into her personality. Then there is the judge. And the parable is told from his perspective. He is the first character in the story, and the majority of the parable takes place in his mind. We are reading his internal dialogue. Judges in ancient Israel, according to Alan Culpepper, were charged with the responsibility of hearing complaints fairly and impartially. There was no jury. Their job description was based on Deuteronomy 1, where it says, Give the members of your community a fair hearing, and judge rightly between one person and another, whether citizen or resident alien. You must not be partial in judging. Hear out the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone, for the judgment is God's. The judge in our parable is described by both Jesus and he describes himself as one who neither feared God nor had respect for people. We know what it means to have no respect for people. We have seen people who act this way. But what does it mean to fear God? Culpepper suggests that to fear God in this context may either be to reverence God or to live in fear of punishment for violating his office as a judge. The judge, by his own admission, did not live up to the job requirements. He is certainly not an example of righteousness, yet he doesn't actually do anything wrong. Yet here he was, caring about neither God nor people, and serving as the judge for his community. We don't know what issue the widow is bringing to him. We only hear her request for justice. And she keeps coming. She keeps asking. Because when there is something of utmost importance to you, you don't give up. What issue or issues are of utmost importance to you? What issues are so important that you must advocate for them, constantly bringing them to others' attention? At first, the judge refused for whatever reason. But later, after she comes to him numerous times, he says to himself, Because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Greek in this sentence is particularly interesting. It brings a harsher perspective. Levine indicates that where the judge says that the widow is bothering him, it literally means causing me labor or giving me work. She goes on to say that, uh, he will grant her justice so that she may not wear him out. Yet the Greek word here, hupopiazo, is a physical term, meaning harass me or even strike me under the eye. And finally, he says he will grant her justice, which is not, he doesn't use the usual word for justice, but leans more towards a word that has the definition of avenge her. This is where we might have some trouble identifying with the widow. By seeking vengeance, she is not exemplifying the love of God. 
although we may be able to name situations where we might feel similarly. Levine suggests that perhaps we are to ask the question in those instances, do I want to be in the widow's company? As with all parables, this story is surprising. It diverts from the ordinary and the expected. The judge is not the most just person, and the widow isn't as blameless and helpless as we might initially think. So where do we go from here? What do we learn from a story where neither character is exactly a person whom we want to emulate? We can first look at the judge. As Culpepper writes, even if it... If even an unjust judge will heed the widow and do what is right, how much more so will God do justice for the poor and oppressed? We can trust that God will care for people, that God will be with us and with those who are oppressed, that God loves us and wants the best for all people especially those whom society deems as lesser or marginal. We can also look back to verse 1, the introduction to the parable which says, Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not lose heart. We need to be careful here as we consider our theology of prayer this parable, I think, is indicating to us not that our prayers only work if we ask them over and over again, like the widow. Instead, what it is reminding us is of our need to be continuously in prayer. First Thessalonians comes to mind, where it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We come back to God over and over. We don't pray once and are done, but we live into that prayer. It becomes who we are. John Wesley believed that all we do is an act of prayer. He says... Whether we think of or speak to God, whether we act or suffer for him, all is prayer. All that a Christian does, even in eating and sleeping, is prayer. Prayer continues in the desire of the heart, in souls filled with love. The desire to please God is a continual prayer. God only requires of his adult children that their hearts be truly purified and that they offer him continually the wishes and vows that naturally spring from perfect love. For these desires, being the genuine fruits of love, are the most perfect prayers that can spring from it. It is, of course, good to bring requests before God, even over and over. God, unlike the judge, does not lose patience with our continual petitions. But it is a fallacy to believe that someone was not healed or an event happened because we didn't pray hard enough or often enough. God hears and understands our hearts. God does not tally quantities or lengths of prayer, and God's justice and mercy is based on love, not accumulated nagging. We know that God will care for and bring justice for all people, especially those who, like the widow, are deemed as others in society. And we know that we need to live our lives as a continual prayer to God, 
in all that we say and do. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.